Please welcome our next speaker, Agnes from Roche, uh, who will be able to provide you the insights of how the pharmaceutical companies deal with the quantum computing technology. Please, Agnes, start. Hello, nice to see you back from the coffee break. While we're waiting for the slides, um, I'm from Ross, and we have a quantum computing team since four years, I would say, since 2018. And I'll give you now a short introduction about what we're doing. Thank you for the slides. And they don't look very well. Ah, great. That's way better. Will this happen? Yeah, that works. So first of all, um, you might not know Roche. Roche is the, I think, the world leading pharmaceutical company. We have three um, independent research units focusing on pharmaceutical products and one unit that's focusing on diagnostic elements. Um, if you are aware of the corona pandemic, we are supplying, I think, many cities and states with, for example, diagnostic um, systems that can mass diagnose the amount of corona in the samples at the same time simultaneously. But our main focus is actually, for example, cancer treatment and ophthalmology, so um, diseases in the eye. Our three, at the moment, I think we are now growing a fourth independent research unit are distributed over the world. So one of them is mainly focused on Europe. That's PRED, that's Pharma Early Research and Development. I'm part of PRED. We also have a site in California in the US, and we also have a site in uh, Japan that's called Chugai. And uh, currently, we are growing a site in Shanghai in China. And from that PRED group, I'm part of um, the data analytics group, it's called in, in the subgroup, that's PRED Informatics. So we are a computer science department, sub, sub department, that's responsible for translating technology into something that's beneficial for, for example, life science. So we look into new technologies, emerging technologies, translate them over into something that actually can be leveraged in the computational drug discovery process we also look into statistics, so we are a mix between computer engineers, computer scientists, data scientists, machine learning experts, and we work closely with our scientists on the right side of the slide, so with people who actually every day do drug discovery projects and are responsible for pursuing the portfolio of PRED. With that, we have two heads. One of the heads is Marielle van der Poel. She's the head of uh, the global area head of scientific solution engineering and architecture. I'm part of that group. And our second head is Martin Schramm. He's the head of data science. Um, and you might not see, but actually what we are spanning here are physicists, computer scientists, engineers, life scientists, and so on. So, and if we look broader in our company, we find even more. So we recently found a quantum mathematician, for example, for our endeavors. It was very interesting. So it tends to get very interesting if we pick up a paper. We started in 2018 with the question how quantum computing can change and disrupt our ways of doing research. And obviously the first thing that you would do is looking around and asking questions. So the team went on and asked questions to IBM, Microsoft, Google and Intel to understand the current hardware, their roadmap and what they actually see as a challenge. We then took on a further step, so we uh, funded master's student work and PhD student work to understand what's actually in scope, what do we have, what are the opportunities. This work is publicly available, so you might, you can look it up later if you want. But still, these, these terms of uh, research, of exploration, didn't answer the question how relevant quantum computing for us was. So we started to also collaborate with over across industries and multiple consortia to ask this question and to learn from other industries. For example, we are together in the, in the CRIC, in the European Quantum Industry Consortium, together with, for example, Airbus, but we are also working together with BMW in the, um, what's called the Quantum Computing Industry Group, that's pretty German-focused. Um, and um, we are part of the Pistoia Alliance. This is an alliance between uh, pharmaceutical companies that pursue pre-competitive work which means that uh, we know in the pharmaceutical industries there are challenges that are too big to handle by one company. We need to work together, for example, data verification, standardization of information and so on. And this is the alliance that we're doing our work in. And then besides learning from other industries, we decided to really try our hand. And for that, we had to identify areas where we are curious about. 
In chemistry simulation, we thought that's our thing, right? But we don't have uh, small molecules that are covalently bound. We actually look into real drug discovery molecules that are binding to a protein in a non-covalent way. In optimization, we do have equations that we, would, we are looking for a minimum, um, but they look a little bit different. So we're wondering why not try this specific equation in optimization. In the machine learning, we are wondering about supervised machine learning because obviously we have patient data X-ray chest images, for example, that would benefit highly from high accurate um, classification. This would mean, for example, a life-altering choice if we could identify, for example, cancer in the lung very, very early. As you know, time is of the essence in the case of cancer. So we tried to find very explicit use cases for these three pillars, and we went out to collaborate with vendors to actually try them out on real quantum hardware. In the first use case in chemistry simulation, um, we looked into protein binding, link, um, binding affinity prediction. What we are having here is that the ligand is not covalently bound to the protein. It's actually in its, in, in its vicinity, um, and you need to treat this properly. This might mean that you've seen some use cases here that are mentioning batteries and so on. This is a little bit slightly different, and the question is, is this now different enough to need a different approach, or is this actually still the same. We don't have the answer for that. So we put out a data set. Actually, we found a data set that we put out already in 2013. It's a pretty good data set for benchmarking because it was done in the, in the Roche laboratories. We know the experimental binding affinity between the respective protein in each of the 12 ligands. And we also know that the protein pocket does not move very much when a ligand comes in and binds. And with that, it's a very, very good benchmarking data set. I cannot repeat this more enough. It's uh, lucky that we have this, actually. If you look a little bit closer at the ligand structures, you see that there is the ligand one time on the left side in, in large. And then you see multiple different head groups on the right side of the slide. And you might notice that actually only on the uh, lower uh, part, lower right part of the oxyzine ring, you see some changes. So you see an F appearing there or not appearing. That's a fluoride. So we have a very local substituents change. And these modulate the binding affinity to the protein. Only this change modulates the binding affinity. So the team at uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing took this data set try to identify the part in the molecule that is highly correlating together with the binding affinity, and this is the upper left part of the oxazine ring, brought that to the quantum machine and tried to solve it via VQE, so with a variation of quantum eigensolver. Um, for that, first they had to uh, cut the ligand into pieces with the density matrix embedding theory. You can read this all up in our public preprint. Um, and definitely we tried this on actual hardware. And this is basically the result. I brought you one of the plots. Uh, we tried this on IBM semiconducting devices and on the ion trap Honeywell devices. This is one of the result plots. They basically look very similar. What's important to notice is that um, in quantum computing, you don't get one result. You have to repeat it multiple times. So you see 60,000 shots, 8,000 shots. You also see the amount of time you have to spend for getting one of these results. And then you see the result plot. On the x-axis, you see the experimental binding affinity. And on the y-axis, you see the, see the computational predicted binding affinity. They should match. So from a data science perspective, you see here quite a nice correlation. But actually, what we are trying to have is that we see two sets of data. So on the, on the right side, we have one set of data, one set of ligands that are the weak binders. Uh, no, the strong binders, sorry. And on the, on, the, on the left side there, we have the weak binders. And they should be on a different predicted energy level. But as you can see with the blue line, they are not at the moment. And we are wondering, maybe in the future, quantum computing might change this. So this is one of our questions. Will there be an algorithm that can actually solve this question? Our next use case is focus on optimization to be very precise in protein folding. Antibodies are at the core of the business of Roche. And we are wondering how we can predict structure, the structure and the properties of certain parts of antibodies. There is one piece here, the H3 loop, that is um, basically the main piece of identifying, for example, a cancer cell in the body. If you could engineer an antibody that would identify a certain type of cancer cell, we could very easily treat a patient. We would be faster in, uh, in engineering these antibodies if you could predict the properties and the structure of this H3 loop. 
the current methods that we have to use are a combination of force field equation solving and machine learning. We don't have anything better. Um, and with that, we thought, well, let's try this out with quantum computing. Obviously, optimization is a problem. So I'll show you now the equation. The main part here is really that we have to solve this equation in every step of, for example, a Monte Carlo optimization. And especially the last term, the non-bonded interaction term, is our main point of concern because it needs to be computed between any atom pair because forces are between any atom pair. Our, um, the team at the Tencent Quantum Computing Lab took this equation and thought, well, we don't have an, a new idea about an algorithm. They'll ju just try and take this equation, bring it over to the quantum hardware and estimate how much resources do we need and how much computation time do we actually need. As a result, they came up with this fantastic table. In the first entry, you can see the classical method. That's a classical Monte Carlo search um, solving this equation step by step. And in total, it takes around 10 days. If we would put this whole equation onto a quantum computer, if this is even possible, um, we actually have a problem because we have high, way slower gates there. So we have a slower gate time, and this multiplies into years of compute time. We also would need more logical qubits, obviously, and they are still not yet there. So that's very interesting, right? So either we see a change in the gate times, or we will find a different approach maybe in solving this equation. And we are very happy to hear if you have a different opinion on that one. Our third use case is about machine learning. I think machine learning is very familiar for, for lots of people here in the room. We have a data set that's called the Medical MNIST data set that's publicly available. And in that we have, for example, um, retina images of people with um, certain degrees of degradation um, of the retina, so it's a five-class classification problem. And we also have um, patient X-ray chest information, uh, chest, chest images of, of a patient and of a healthy person. And it would always be good if we could identify such phenomena very early so that we have a better chance in treatment. The question here would be if quantum computing can actually help us, for example, speeding up training time, reducing the amount of training time, Reaching higher accuracy, higher accuracy for when actually lives are at stake is always a thing you should go for. So the team set out together with QC where to explore what uh, quantum computing can do for us. And in quantum computing, um, it has a very inherent ability to, um, um, to, to run um, linear algebra operations. So the team set out to try out two types of neural networks. One of them is a quantum-assisted neural, net um, quantum neural network, where the neural network is on the classical computer, while the weight computation is on the quantum computer. And the second uh, type that was tried out are the orthogonal neural networks on the quantum hardware. That means that the full neural network is on the quantum device, um, and we could maybe leverage the uh, inherent ability of orthogonal matrices. So um, any operation on a quantum computer is uh, by default orthogonal, so it might have a more stable gradient, it might reach more, a higher accuracy, and a higher accuracy is something we are very interested in. Due to the size of the quantum hardware, we were only able to run this on very small uh, neural networks, as you can see in the lower part of the slide, so like four input nodes, eight input nodes. So I wouldn't use any fancy language to describe these results. But as a summary, we can say that at the moment, the classical approach and the simulations agree. When we bring the results, so the, the implementation to the actual hardware, we see a drop in quality, but as you know, we are currently in the noisy area of quantum hardware, so that was to be expected. We will see if this will hold up in the future, and we'll see if maybe accuracy might be a thing that we can leverage. Yeah, and obviously in machine learning, we always compete against the uh, GPUs, so we'll see where they will go as well. And maybe there will be some different ways of doing the work. In summary, in our opinion, um, we have now established baselines that are relevant for, our, for the pharmaceutical industry. So we have put out very specific use cases that are basically ready to be used. Um, so that we, for example, can better compare new um, improvements in quantum computing against um, the ones that we've tried in our actual application to fully understand what's 
is it now really a game changer or are we still actually at the same position that we were last year? What we also found in working closely together with our, um, with our cooperation partners is that actually translating the problem onto quantum hardware into quantum algorithms is quite a difficult task. So without the help of our life scientists experts, it would have been, um, I think, partially not, not possible because the translation work is so important, especially in, in chemistry simulation. So we think that while the roadmap for quantum hardware is pretty clear, it will come sometime, we are still not seeing exactly the algorithms that we think will scale on them. And I think this has been repeated already today multiple times, so I think um, we can all agree that there needs to be more fundamental research in algorithms and we need to work together to actually shape them so that they will fit to our purpose. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the team. So many people were involved in these three preprints. Um, in the chemistry simulation case, we worked together with Cambridge Quantum Computing, and I would like to um, um, mention Josh Kono and our use case leader from the Roche site, Let Detlef. In the optimization uh, use case, we worked together with the Tencent Quantum Lab at Shenzhen in China, um, uh, especially thanks to John Alcock and our use case leader in Rush to Stanislav. And in the machine learning use case, we work together with the QCWare, um, with uh, Nathan uh, Jonas in, in Jordanis. They are basically stationed here in Paris. Paris. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Yvonne Lee as a use case leader in our machine learning use case. And as usual, let's try to do now what patients need next. So let's try to find algorithms that actually treat patients and solve cancer, for example, or find early on um, any sign of disease so that they can be, can be treated early on. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Anis. Great presentation, and let's see if we have any questions from audience. I see already Benno. Are there? Yeah, I noticed that recently uh, Google DeepMind made some bullish claims that they had solved protein folding. So <laughs> I noticed that you are trying to do it with quantum. Is there still a need for quantum there or, or has uh, DeepMind done that's, it? As that's claim? the typical question, so I hope you understood. So the question is, did AlphaFold 2 solve protein folding? And the answer is not really. Um, so um, AlphaFold 2 is active in the area of de novo protein folding. Um, and it can only work on proteins for which it has templates. If AlphaFold 2 didn't see a template, and for the H3 loop, we don't have templates else, we would have done that. Uh, we tried. Um, then it cannot predict H the H3 loop. And especially with the focus on um, property prediction, so with the proteins that AlphaFold 2 predicts, you cannot do high accuracy calculations of properties. They tell you about the general secondary fold, uh, tertiary fold of a protein, but you don't do property predictions with that when we try to engineer antibody. That doesn't work. So they did somewhat, and it's, we are going to see what's going to happen in the future, but they really spent years of trying to do de novo prediction. So I think doing a high accuracy prediction without having a template, that's yet, I think, another challenge. Thank you. One more question, if you have. All right, thank you very much, Agnes. Let's then switch to the next and the last speaker today before we actually launch our round table. What? Oh. Our round table session. So it's Frederic Barbaresco from Thales. Oh, just please come. <laughs> Oh, yes, and David Sabek from Thales. You can actually come off. We have enough microphones. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, so once one more representative of our space sector will share with us the insights on how the Thales integrates quantum computing technology in their businesses, please. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us uh, today, uh, Frederic, Babaisko, and, and me. Uh, we're going just to give you a glance of uh, what we've been doing so far at Thales uh, along the, the lines of uh, quantum uh, algorithms and, and, and computing. Um, 
Uh, well, the, the situation is uh, that we are uh, uh, setting up our roadmap uh, on, on this topic and uh, establishing also our uh, uh, partnership ecosystem. And this is uh, and, and identifying also the, the, the major use cases where we think that uh, uh, quantum computing and algorithms uh, would uh, really be uh, a game changer for, for, for uh, Dallas application domains. Um, so, uh, how does it work this way? If, uh, okay. Um, okay, uh, so this, uh, this slide, uh, just to uh, um, underline the, the rationale, uh, rationale for which uh, uh, Thales is, uh, of course, interested in, uh, in uh, to start uh, using quantum computing and, and algorithms as soon as possible. Uh, the, the the first the first reason is of course the the the, the addressing uh, a complex problem which cannot be uh, uh, tackled or which are not tractable in in human time with uh, with uh, even with supercomputers with with HPC and other kind of computers. The, the second reason is is the resolution uh, of. Uh, 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 current uh, problems we are uh, we are we are tackling, uh, but in 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 faster, in 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 faster way than by uh, traditional computers, and the third reason, which is uh, which also uh, will become increasingly uh, uh, a key reason, also is the advantage uh, as far as quantum uh, green. Uh, uh, is, is concerned, I would say, and the, the, with, with respect uh, to uh, cost, weight, and, and energy. And in this case, we are also in the, in the opinion that the quantum will, will make a difference uh, uh, along this line. Um, okay, so uh, what we'd like to do, what we are doing actually, is, is to anticipate uh, the use of uh, quantum computing for real applications by, by really mastering the, the, the uh, use of, of suitable quantum computers and software libraries. Uh, uh, and, and as you know, there are many things which are popping up uh, uh, right now uh, in as, as, uh, as far as uh, software libraries are concerned, for example. And we'd like also to accelerate the, the design of, uh, of uh, quantum algorithms. Uh, on the three uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, quantum computers, uh, uh, quantum annealers, NISC and, and LSQ. Uh, and uh, what we would like to be is also not only uh, a consumer of uh, quantum computing and algorithms, but also producers of uh, innovators in, in, in uh, quantum algorithms uh, in, in different domains by, by inventing uh, uh, new uh, quantum algorithms. By the way, in Thales, there is a, a huge community of, uh, of uh, algorithm experts uh, in Thales uh, for uh, different subjects, uh, signal processing, artificial intelligence, and so on. And uh, we would like also to uh, keep the, the, the expertise we have in algorithmics and to uh, really uh, also uh, start to apply it to, uh, with, with, with the quantum technologies. So what we are doing is, is creating dedicated teams in different uh, TRTs, which are the Thales Research and Technology Centers, one in France, one in Canada, and, and so on, and setting up what we, we call a, a Thales Global Quantum Hub, which is a, a kind of network of uh, partnerships uh, worldwide uh, in all the the places where, where Thales has a, a footprint, uh, at least uh, uh, research and, and technology-wise. And uh, then also to consider, consolidate and, and, and benchmark uh, uh, these technologies, quantum computing, on, on real use cases from Thales. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll be uh, presenting uh, just a, a flavor of these kind of use cases in, in a few minutes. And of course, being part of, of the, 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 the European, the French, European, and, and international uh, ecosystem uh, by setting up also cooperation with startups, uh, RTUs, and industrial partners. Uh, and uh, I will say a few words about this also. Uh, you can see here examples of startups and uh, research centers and, and industries we, we have started to work with. Um, these are the, the, the categories of uh, problems 
uh, where we uh, think that uh, uh, quantum computing and algos uh, would really uh, allow to uh, uh, solve. Uh, you can see here the different categories, and for each category, actually, uh, we have use cases uh, which are suitable to be addressed with, with, with quantum algorithms. So you can see here optimization, Monte Carlo methods, machine learning, cryptography. Here we are not talking about uh, uh, post-quantum cryptography, which is not, by the way, a quantum technology, but uh, uh, what we are trying to do is, is to, uh, to uh, 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 use uh, quantum algorithms to test and to uh, submit to a kind of, uh, of a crash test uh, post-quantum uh, uh, algos. Uh, solving also differential equations and simulating uh, at the quantum level uh, materials. Uh, this is also the, this, uh, in, in all these uh, categories we have use cases uh, for, from Thales domain. So as you know, Thales is, is a, a company whose, uh, uh, whose uh, application domain ranges from aeronautics uh, uh, to uh, digital security and digital identity passing through uh, space and, and defense, uh, uh, any milieu, uh, or, 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 or milieu. So, uh, okay. Uh, basically, uh, the application of, uh, of, uh, of quantum computing and algos uh, uh, can be uh, divided in, in two categories here. The, the, the use cases were, uh, were, which are much more related to uh, engineering, a kind of augmented engineering, and uh, where the, the, the application of, uh, of quantum technologies is, is done offline, I would say. You can see here example of use cases, such as electromagnetic simulation, uh, the, the design, uh, the optimization for antennas, for example, or radars, uh, the massive testing of complex systems, uh, the performance assessment, for example, and all these use cases are constrained by, by accuracy, and what we are trying to do there is really to quantify uncertainty and to uh, optimize, of course, the, the accuracy of the, of the different results, and these use cases are uh, roughly uh, speaking related to uh, the engineering process, and the, these are not in, in, uh, in, in operation. The second class of use cases are uh, online use cases, and in this case it's uh, 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 um, as, comparison, as compared to augmented engineering, this is the, we are here in augmented operation, and uh, here uh, the, the, the use cases are constrained by low latency, for example, and for people who are familiar with the def defense domain, uh, the, the main objective is to accelerate the, the OODA loop, uh, which means that the, you know, the, the OODA loop is the uh, observe, orient, decide, and act loop, which is, uh, very uh, fundamental uh, loop actually in, uh, in the def defense domain. So you can see uh, uh, as examples of uh, these kind of use cases, mission planning, for example, or uh, mass massive intelligence, EMINT is image intelligence, or electromagnetic uh, intelligence uh, systems, or the reconfiguration of complex systems like the command and control systems, anomaly detection, or resource allocation. And all these use cases actually have to be handled in, 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 in real time, online, uh, uh, during the, 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 the run time or the operation time. Um, so, um, as you know, uh, of course, uh, just to uh, recall that uh, uh, we, as I said, uh, we are interested in the three kind of, of uh, uh, quantum computers, the, the quantum annealers, uh, were the, the main category of problems which can be implemented uh, on quantum annealers are this, the cubo problems, as, as you know, the quadratic and constrained binary optimization problems. And we are also interested in, in the NISC problems with basically uh, uh, approximation, uh, uh, well, problems which could be approached uh, uh, in an uh, approximation way, uh, such as statistical-based problems or, or stochastic-based problems and also in the large-scale quantum uh, computers also uh, were uh, our main interest, as we, we will present in, in a very few uh, minutes, uh, is uh, especially in, uh, in linear systems uh, uh, of equation uh, solving uh, and, and, and using especially uh, inverting matrix, for example. Um, okay, so let me now uh, hand over to uh, Frédéric, who will uh, 
go in more details in this kind of, uh, of problems and also uh, present at least uh, very briefly some use cases we have uh, been addressing so far. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, so, uh, yes, as said by David, we would like to address the three kinds of uh, quantum computers, but each of them has their uh, constraints, for example, constraint of connectivity for quantum annular, so it's, uh, it's a, it could be a constraint to define a Kubo uh, problem. On uh, for NISC, also, we are limited by accuracy on the level of noise on the number of qubits, and on, on, on for LSQ, for the first version, we will be also limited by uh, the number of qubits on uh, quantum gates. So one challenge for Thales is how to program this kind of machine with limited resources in terms of, uh, uh, term of qubits of quantum gates on, on relative to the uh, available uh, accuracy. I will give you some examples that we have benchmarked on different kinds of uh, quantum uh, computers. This first one is on uh, synthetic aperture radar image segmentation for based on Markov random field. During the 90s, many works has been done in image processing based on a Markov random field on Markov random chain, but it was very difficult to process them in real time. But this kind of problem is well adapted for Kubo problem because we can define a, a, an Hamiltonian that we can describe in terms of a, a Kubo problem. And we can modelize the, the Markov field problem with the marginal law and the posterior law very easily on a, on a quantum annealer. So we have tested first segmentation of synthetic aperture radar images. Another example, it's a long history of radar. Uh, people are working on how to optimize the waveforms, especially time series of phase code, uh, which is a very long history in radar uh, research. And uh, what is very well known is Barker code. And where one of our objectives was to optimize this kind of waveform and to minimize the side lobes of this waveform. It was especially to study this new uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, waveform with very long time series because for the time being we know only a, a, a Barker code with a length of 13 uh, pulses uh, which are optimal. And, and so we have made some first benchmark on D-Wave machine and we, have, uh, we are very, uh, very uh, happy from the result because we have recovered the Barker code which are uh, known in the waveform radar community. And so we would like to go further with a polyphase code, for instance, for instance or for mismatch filter. Another very important topic for Thales is electromagnetic simulations, uh, because we are developing uh, different electromagnetic equipment, uh, so radar antenna, communication and electronic warfare uh, equipment. And we are developing also uh, high, power, uh, high power tube uh, has a Clistron, for example, for satellites. So it's very important to accelerate the uh, partial differential equation simulation of this uh, electromagnetic field. So Maxwell equation for radar, but uh, for, uh, for Clistron, it's uh, Maxwell Vlasov uh, equation. And so, so we have to, uh, so the, the main objective for this acceleration is to optimize the design of this uh, electromagnetic equipment, but also to optimize the placement of this equi equipment on airborne platform or satellite platform due to the electromagnetic compatibility. So we have signed, uh, just signed a partnership with uh, EDF, Electricité de France, to uh, develop in a joint team uh, some first benchmark on partial differential equation on quantum computer. And more recently, we are collaborating with Fraunhofer Institute IIAS uh, in Germany on, uh, to address some problems of, uh, of um, satellite image uh, matching. And so uh, we have developed with Fraunhofer a very uh, disruptive and innovative uh, algorithm which mixed a quantum annular uh, solution and a quantum gate solution. So we are computing the kernel computation on quantum gate and we are computing k-point extraction and matching on quantum annular. And uh, Fraunhofer has defined a pipeline mixing uh, quantum gates on quantum annular. So this is the first result of, uh, of this application. 
We have also participated to the uh, Hackathon uh, Quantics, which has been uh, organized by uh, Elvira. So thank you, Elvira, for this uh, event. Uh, and we were uh, shortlisted among the, the, the five uh, finalists. And we, we have finished as the second of the ten uh, uh, competitors. And in during this hackathon, we have developed a QAWAR uh, version of uh, this uh, radar waveform design uh, use cases and, uh, to address more complex uh, problems like a mismatch uh, filter, uh, where the, the emission and the reception time series are different. And now we would like to address what we call the polyphase uh, code, which are more and more complex uh, problems for waveform design. Uh, we were also interested by quantum computer performance uh, benchmarking. Uh, so we have to, to, to look at different tools which have been studied, like QScore by Atos or SuperMarkQ suit by SuperTech or quantum Impact by Berkeley or Klops by IBM. So how to benchmark uh, the quantum hardware, but also the quantum algorithm on the quantum hardware, which is very important to make some progress uh, in this area. And so we have some first publication on, uh, with my colleague from uh, AIT UK, uh, with uh, John Rarity on uh, Hugh Griffiths in, uh, in London. We are preparing a special issue of uh, radar sonar navigation, which will be dedicated to radar application of quantum computer on uh, quantum algorithm. So I give now the microphone to David for the conclusion. Okay, so uh, just now to, uh, oops, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, now just to uh, summarize uh, somehow the, the, the partnerships we are, uh, we have started actually in, 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 this, uh, in this domain. Uh, we are involved in this uh, project which is called AQUAPS, which means actually in, uh, in English the advantage of uh, quantum for uh, solving uh, uh, planning and scheduling problems. This is, uh, this is a project with uh, the startup Pascal and with the Gen C, which is the, the uh, infrastructure of uh, uh, high performance computing. And this is uh, supported, funded actually by uh, Ile de France. Uh, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are uh, other uh, partnerships, uh, Frédéric mentioned the one with the Fraunhofer Institute, the IAIS, uh, on two topics there, on uh, infrared point target detection on complex backgrounds and, and one on, uh, in the satellite domain on bundle adjustment for, from a set of, of images. And we have also uh, a cooperation with uh, ENS uh, Paris-Saclay, on the on, on the quantum programming and uh, functional languages here, uh, so this is all the part of uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, on uh, uh, the, the 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 languages and the libraries uh, uh, for for quantum algos. Uh, uh, we have also a, a cooperation with uh, with uh, Quebec uh, in in Canada with the University of Sherbrooke, where is there. Uh, all uh, a zone which is called a zone of uh, innovation, of quantum innovation actually. And uh, we have set up a partnership on quantum machine learning. Uh, the use cases, uh, the use case there is, is uh, quantum uh, algos for anomaly detection, uh, for side channel attacks in, in the field of, of cryptography. Um, this slide is just to recall the European quantum computer providers we uh, uh, have started to interact with uh, some of them in, in, in France, especially we are really concretely partnering with the, the, the three uh, startups which are mentioned then, Pascal, uh, Quandela, and, and Alice and Bob. Uh, as, as mentioned earlier, so Pascal is on, uh, uh, on uh, quantum annulers and, and NISC, Quandela is on NISC, and, and Alice and Bob are on, on the LSQ uh, technology. And the, 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 the chart you, you see here 
is from the uh, the quick uh, uh, document where we just uh, uh, enhance this chart with with uh, with 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 some startups we we have uh, we are we are interacting with uh, uh, right now. Uh, we are also uh, in the perspective of uh, uh, different benchmarks on uh, quantum computer simulators uh, with these uh, different uh, simulators uh, providers. And we started, as, as mentioned uh, by uh, Frédéric also, I don't know if you mentioned this, but we did, did a benchmark on, uh, on D-Wave uh, computer, for example, on, uh, on uh, uh, waveform optimization. And we will uh, uh, keep uh, uh, carrying out this uh, these benchmarks uh, uh, benchmark on, on also quantum simulators. Um, uh, here uh, we uh, on, on this chart actually you know probably this uh, this scale which is the QTRL scale here uh, as compared to the TRL the technology readiness level. So this is the quantum technology readiness level. Uh, 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 we took this from uh, a document uh, produced by uh, Hulish in uh, Germany and uh, we've just set up the, the status where we are now. Uh, so we, in our opinion, we are some, somewhere between QTRL 4 and, and 5, probably more QTRL 4. All technologies uh, 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 taken uh, together. Um, and uh, finally, uh, this is the kind of stack of, uh, of the, the different layers for quantum functional programming where we uh, uh, have indicated where Thales uh, is playing or intending to play uh, a role there. As I said uh, at the beginning of my, my talk that we are uh, we are uh, really uh, in the perspective to become uh, not only uh, uh, an algo, uh, quantum algorithms uh, uh, consumer, but also a producer. And this implies uh, mastering uh, uh, different layers in, in, on this stack, uh, especially uh, also the, 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 the innovation and the design of new quantum algorithms uh, and, and uh, quantum algorithm library uh, uh, as, as really uh, innovation in, 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 in this domain. Um, okay, uh, this is just to say that we are, uh, what we, our approach is to be hardware agnostic uh, as far as compilers, for example, uh, are concerned and not to be stuck to a kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, hardware for uh, any, any kind of, uh, of uh, uh, quantum computer. Uh, finally, I just would like to, to conclude this talk by mentioning the, the of course, the, the key issue, which is the, which is the issue of, uh, of, uh, of talents and experts in, in quantum computing and algorithms. And uh, uh, this charge also is taken from a, a study done for the, uh, the White House in the, the US and where the, the expert, uh, expert talents in quantum computing will probably uh, be uh, an issue in the, in the coming years and it's very important to uh, uh, also start uh, uh, not only uh, educating and training people in, in this domain and also uh, be very uh, cautious on the fact that this, this, these talents are, are really rare and uh, the, the demand is, is, uh, is huge. Uh, uh, from the, the states, from China and so on, and we as, as uh, European people, so we should be also uh, be very careful about the, the brain drain uh, as far as uh, this, uh, this, uh, this issue is concerned. Okay, so I will stop here my talk. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll be very happy to try to answer at least. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very interesting. We have... Time for one quick, very, very quick question because we're running out of time, please. Yeah, we have much less people right now <laughs> than before. Probably it's the fact of this is the last session, but yeah, well, if anywhere. If you have questions offline, so you have yeah. our email, so please uh, feel free uh, to, uh, to reach out with us and uh, we could, uh, 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 well, uh, continue this, uh, this discussion offline. Thank Thanks you again. very much. Don't hesitate to approach Frédéric. Um, 
um, during the, po well, we won't have any, any pause anymore, but yes, feel free, please. Um, now let's start quickly, move quickly to the round table, the final part of our quantum computing session today. So I, I just wanted to welcome all the uh, round table representatives here um, all together. So let's start with a quantum provider, Cecilia Han, the CEO of Quantinum, and Ben Breuer, the CCO of Pascal. <laughs> yes. When we have Julian from Capgemini, head of Quantum Lab in Capgemini, we have Jean Gabriel from Lab Quantique, who is the founder and uh, uh, president of Le Lab Quantique, is a French association which works in relation with the French government as well. And also, he is an uh, investor at Quanta Nation, the <coughs> investment fund, uh, fund which invests in the deep physics startups and specifically startups in the quantum computing. We have Daniel uh, from Sineca and we have Yasser Omar from Portuguese Quantum Institute who is coordinating the quantum initiative in there. Please install yourself. I will probably ask one more microphone because we need them. Ah, okay. How many we have? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, I think we are all set. So thank you very much, first of all, for accepting this discussion. Um, I hope it will be interesting and useful also for people or for companies who are maybe very much curious about quantum but not decided yet to, 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 to launch in this journey. So we hope that with this session we could provide some of the insights from the other side of the story, from the providers, consulting groups, and our representatives of the quantum computing ecosystem on how their problems and challenges can be solved. And let's start with Ilias and Benno. Uh, the first question is to you, so um, we know you because, sorry, <laughs> we know you. Oh, yeah. No, no worries. So we know you, first of all, as the successful founders of uh, two quantum computing software and middleware startups, Cambridge Quantum Computing and Q and Co. Uh, that were one of the pioneers, let's say, in the quantum computing ecosystem. And recently, um, we received a very, let's say, exciting announcement of mergers. Um, in the case of a Cambridge Quantum, it was together with a hardware provider, Honeywell. In the case of QNCO, it was with a French hardware provider, Pascal. So we would like to know more what was the motivation behind, actually, this merger and uh, how does it uh, expand your activities and your perspective and your vision actually um, on the quantum computing technology in application to the industrial use cases? Well, first of all, we, we were second to do this merger, so uh, thank you for the, the good <laughs> advice. <laughs> um, of course, there's, there's many aspects when you do such a merger. I just want to highlight a few of them. Uh, one of the key aspects for us to do this merger was the, the fact that we wanted to be a full stack company. Um, as a standalone quantum software company, we realized that at this stage of the technology, it's very important to align your algorithms, your software to the hardware. Uh, it is impossible to reach near-term quantum advantage without that alignment. And we tried to do that in uh, partnerships with quantum hardware players, uh, had multiple partnerships with them, but we noticed that when you try to do that in a partnership, you, you don't always show everything and they don't always show everything and tell everything. Um, so we realized that we needed to get closer, closer to the hardware and we needed to be able to share more on our side. And in a merger, it's a marriage, so uh, you have to show and tell everything. And, uh, and, and, and that is so far working really well. Over the last two months, two and a half months that we've been working together in this marriage, we've already achieved many breakthroughs on our algorithms, implementing them in a better and more efficient way on the Pascal hardware. So we are very happy with that uh, benefit of it. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation as well. Um, great to be here. Um, <clears throat> it's a question that could occupy us for quite a long time, so I'll keep it to the two minutes um, and try and hit the headlights. Um, the first point is scale. 
um, global scale. This is a long-term journey. We do not see any significant quantum advantage in day-to-day -day activity on computable problems for a number of years. And having the scale, the Thales uh, conversation just a few moments ago, looking at the stack, is scale in people, scale in capital, scale in geography. So we're about 450 people, and I can tell you we can probably be another 450 people, and possibly even another 400 after that in the next two or three years, and we still would not be able to address each aspect of the problem properly. So that was our primary motivation. If we're going to do this properly and we're going to do this over the next five or 10 years, you've got to be independent, you've got to be fully funded. You do not have to keep looking down at your detail and worry about how you're going to get around the next corner. You don't have to scurry around and satisfy venture capitalists for you know, next quarter's revenue. And you certainly don't have to pretend uh, that you're going to solve problems the next day. So that was a primary motivation. And, um, and in Honeywell, who were already an investor, and as uh, people may know, IBM is also now an investor in our company, and we are about to announce a Japanese and a European industrial investor as well. We wanted scale, so this was point number one. Uh, point number two is we have an aspiration to be platform agnostic, platform neutral. So our device is not uh, being resold or offered to uh, users. We took a decision that we don't want to be in that game. We don't want to be in the commodity hardware selling game at this stage when there's no advantage. What we're trying to do is provide the full stack solution. And we're also, um, because we have something called Ticket, which is this compiler, uh, literally half a million people around the world now use Ticket and uh, I think it's 20 odd backends, and so we just wanted to scale that as well um, at the academic level. Uh, lastly, of course, um, there is a, an, a, an interest from lots and lots of people to try and uh, look at quantum computing and what it might mean. And if you're a global company, um, you're not gonna be satisfied with a one-off shot. I think the Roche conversation was really interesting in that regard. So we want to be the most eligible partner for long-term multi-year contracts where we're not squabbling over the next $5,000. We really are focused on doing things over the next five or six years. We share IP and you can only do that at scale. So those were the three motivations. That's great, thank you very much. And since you already started to speak about the growth of interest, so for instance, CQC was founded in 2014, right? Right. right? So um, we are now in 2022. How, how big is this interest? Can you, can you estimate maybe the, or give some prognosis for the future? Are all the companies- well, the, 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 yeah. the, the data set is more transparent, right? So if you look beyond the headlights of what people want to amplify because they want their reputation to be better, which is fine. If you look at actual paying customers, organizations that are willing to spend a quarter of a million dollars or more on some kind of project, which is a, a toy project or a proof of concept, if you look at that bar, then we have about 80, 80 projects, and that's just us. This time last year, I don't think we had 10, right? So. Uh, but that's just us. I, I, mean, I don't know about what, what's going on elsewhere. We, we don't have line of sight. So I, we look beyond the headline. If somebody just wants to write something, that's fine. That's up to them. But in terms of real paying customers. And I think the nice thing is that these are informed customers. These are people who do not expect to solve a problem tomorrow. So that, again, Roche, um, I, I'm just picking on Roche. Oh, BMW as well. I mean, you guys are really grounded. So whoever's using this is, is, is well informed and there's no hype involved. So I think that's fine. But these proof of concepts are not recurrent income. Yeah. You know, this is, these are one-offs. Um, so whether they last this year or next year, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But we have about 80 and we had 10 last year, less than 10. Yeah, I want to add to that, that uh, well, build on that actually, is that we are seeing a trend that, that the, the end users of, of quantum at this stage are getting much more sophisticated than a couple of years ago. Uh, when, uh, when I started in, in this business, uh, people would typically, uh, I don't know, when they wanted to get going with quantum, uh, go to the IBM Q experience, uh, test out a few uh, examples there, and then their whole world would sort of assume that uh, quantum was this 
superconducting qubit architecture that IBM uh, painted and that you just went there, uh, 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 set up an account and you could be in your garage developing quantum algorithms. Uh, nowadays, the, the industry has, more, uh, has become more sophisticated and users have become more sophisticated. They understand the differences between the different hardware. They understand indeed the limitations of the different uh, uh, types of hardware and the timelines that we're talking about to get to, to, to quantum advantage. Uh, and also the effort it takes to develop these quantum algorithms. So it's not only the numbers, but the inter interaction with the end users is much more sophisticated and much more elaborate than a couple of years ago. So there, you observe certain maturity from your clients? Definitely a, a form of maturity indeed. Yeah, that's great. Then Ben, a question to you. Um, Ilias already mentioned Ticket, which is uh, one of the uh, well best known uh, products uh, from CQC, we, uh, from Continuum right now. So we all also seen the presentation from Roche. We mentioned Human, is a very extensive uh, quantum chemistry library that provides the chemistry solution. Um, what about Pascal? We've seen a lot of mentions of Pascal today during the during the talks. Um, first, congratulations. But can you um, maybe? Um, give some examples of the products that you develop right now. Yeah, first of all, I want to correct a misconception. We did not sponsor the last session. <laughs> so, so um, uh, yes, uh, we, we have indeed uh, uh, quite a range of, uh, of, of solutions. Of course, we, we, we have the hardware, and uh, over the next uh, couple of months, you will see that come online in the cloud. So that's uh, uh, last Monday, we announced that uh, later this year will become available in Azure. Uh, and uh, you will see many diff developments like that from our side. Um, fundamentally, what you will see from the, from the product side, it is a true merger of the applications that uh, Q&Co had already developed. So we already had a platform called QBAC for chemistry simulation. Uh, for our uh, proprietary solutions for solving differential equations, we will later in the year come out with a uh, product for that, uh, similar, similar to, uh, to what we've done for the chemistry side. And um, one of our visions of how to bring these products to market uh, is through integrations with classical uh, uh, software packages. So we already, I think it's now two years ago, started a partnership with a company called Schrodinger Inc., which is one of the global market leaders in uh, classical chemistry software. And the idea behind that was that, that we noticed that quantum is not a replacement of classical computing. It is a, uh, an addition. It is something that end users can uh, use to enhance their computational workflows. And maybe these workflows have 20 steps. You want to replace one or two of these steps with a quantum computational subroutine. And as an end user, you don't necessarily want to have two years in training in quantum to do that. So you want to do that plug and play in your existing classical software. And that's been always the vision of Q and Co, and we'll continue that in our products with uh, Pascal. So that's a, a couple of the highlights uh, of what we will be bringing out over the next months, and uh, a little bit on the vision on the product. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to, to ask the question from Jean Gabriel, who is who is representing venture capitals um, and investors into the quantum computing technology. So we already had two examples of this phenomena merger between the software and hardware company. Do you think this is a new trend? Should we expect much more mergers like that in the upcoming years? What could you comment on that, please? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, maybe a few words about quantum nation for those who, who don't know us. So we are the first VC fund dedicated to quantum technologies. Uh, today we raised 70 million euros and we have 15 portfolio companies. q and Co and Pascal used to be uh, in our portfolio, but, portfolio, but now it's uh, only Pascal. Um, I just want to um, illustrate what was said by Elias and, uh, and Beno. Uh, I believe that uh, the, the, the statistic is that in, in 2015, 3% of the corporates were